reading is from Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 22 and verse 27. Once when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, that one of the ancient prophets has arisen. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the Messiah of God. He sternly ordered and commanded them not to tell anyone, saying, the Son of Man must undergo a great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. But truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Thank you, Tammy. The reading continues where Tammy left off. This is Luke 9, 28 to 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with them. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, silent in those days and told no one any of the things they had seen. This ends our readings for this Sunday morning. God is speaking to us through these words, and when God speaks, those words are true, and we can trust them. Would you pray with me, please? May the words that I speak and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks. And Peter confesses what they all were thinking, or at least what they were hoping. You are the Messiah of God. Surprisingly, Peter is not given a gold star for the right answer. Instead, Jesus seems to change the subject. Great suffering lies ahead, he tells them. Rejection by his own people, death on a Roman cross, and then a raising on the third day. The disciples are baffled, of course. None of this is what messiahs do. And while dying is bad enough, that raised on the third day part makes no sense at all. But it gets worse. Anyone who wants to follow him, Jesus says, must take up their own cross and prepare for the same treatment. Then he tells them, right after that, that they, right after he tells them they're all about to die, he makes this cryptic promise. There are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Well, perhaps ne what happens next, that strange, that wonderful night on the mountaintop fulfills this promise. Jesus climbs the mountain with Peter and James and John. They travel up the mountain to pray and in a pattern that will repeat itself later, that while Jesus prays, the disciples want to sleep until the light comes on. While Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changes. His clothes become a dazzling white. Matthew and Mark in their gospel say he was transfigured. And the Greek word they use there is metamorphosis, the word that we use to describe caterpillars becoming butterflies. One thing becoming something entirely different. And for a brief moment in this vision, 
Jesus has changed from what he was into something Luke can only struggle to describe. And then Moses and Elijah appear. Now that part would have made some strange kind of sense to the disciples because centuries before, <clears throat> Moses had promised that one day a prophet like him would come, someone that they would need to listen to. His presence there suggests that Jesus is that prophet. And Malachi, the last prophet of our Old Testament said, that the prophet Elijah would come to announce the arrival of the day of the Lord. So Elijah and Moses showing up right then signals for Peter and James and John that something big is about to happen. The world is about to turn, as the hymn says. And then there is that bright, dark cloud, full of light, but impenetrable to them. And the voice frightening in its strangeness, overwhelming with its force. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. The disciples are terrified, Luke says. <clears throat> no kidding. <clears throat> and then everything goes silent and dark. They look up and they see only Jesus. What just happened, they wonder. Did anything happen? A vision, maybe? Their overwrought, overtired imaginations? They don't know. They come down the mountain in the morning, and right away, Jesus does battle with another force. A boy has been brought to Jesus. His father tells him the child has long suffered from terrible seizures, epilepsy, Matthew says, though the father says he is seized by a spirit. With the command, Jesus heals the boy and restores him to his father. And then, while everybody is expressing great astonishment at his power, Jesus turns to his friends and he says, let these words sink into your mind, meaning he could not be more serious. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed. So what is going on here? We take a step back. What we see is Luke crafting a story. Something happened on that mountain. Peter and James and John agree it was indescribable, but Mark, Matthew, and Luke do their best to describe it anyway. On one side of the mountain, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus responds, yes, but the Messiah must suffer rejection, and death. On the other side of the mountain, Jesus proves the spirits of disease are no contest for him. And Jesus says again to his disciples, yes, but the Messiah must suffer rejection and death. And in between is this glorious, mysterious, and completely baffling night on the mountaintop. Jesus glows with the blinding light of holiness. Moses and Elijah confirm what Jesus already knows. The voice booms from the cloud, resounding off the hills. This is my son, listen to him. So what is the point? Well, to be honest, I'm pretty sure I don't know. This will sound strange, I suppose, but it's true. I have never really liked this story. It has always mystified me I have never been able to figure it out. And I like it when things get figured out. Mystery, at least in my earlier years, was something I was never very fond of. But a while ago, I read a commentary on this passage where the author said something like, yeah, this story is full of mystery, but that is the point. The mystery, the strangeness, the impossibility is what this story is about. Think about it. Up until this point in Luke's gospel, Jesus is just this guy, you know, an extraordinary human being to be sure, an articulate, incisive teacher, but a man, simply a man, nonetheless. Until the day 
He climbs the mountain with Peter and James and John. The mountaintop erupts in blinding light that seems to be shining out of him, light that every place else in Scripture signals the presence of God. Moses and Elijah, two of the greatest saints of the Hebrew Bible, drop by for a chat, and clearly they have come to serve him, not to be served by him. And then there's that bellowing voice. This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. What could we possibly say about all of this? Or to ask that question in a way that might be more relevant to us, what can we say about any of those times in our lives when something happens that we can't understand, but sure feels like an encounter with the divine, with the holy, with something we have to call God? Well, maybe there's nothing to say. Maybe you just kind of shut up and feel the jaw-dropping majesty, the mind-numbing mystery, and the heart-fluttering tenderness. Because sometimes, in fact, every single time that we encounter the holy, words will fail. There is a time to speak and a time to be silent the wise man said in the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Whenever the mystery of God's tender mercy meets us, whether on a mountaintop of joy or in a valley of despair, it is a time for grateful wonder and silence. It is a time, as the poet Denise Levertov wrote, to fall into Creator Spirit's deep embrace, knowing no effort earns that all surrounding grace. Luke says about Peter and James and John, they kept silent in those days and told no one any of the things they had seen. And don't think the others didn't ask. Once they got over their disappointment at being left behind, they would have peppered James and Peter and John with all kinds of questions. And the best the three could have said was something like, you know, you, you wouldn't understand. I can't explain it. I, I really don't know what happened. It is telling, I think, that the Gospel of John, which according to, tradition, to the tradition might have been written by the John who went up on the mountain, is the only of the four Gospels that does not tell this story. Even many decades after, John could not find the words to describe what happened that night. Although he does come close, in his introduction to the gospel, when he writes this, the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son, who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. An encounter with the divine cannot easily or maybe ever be rendered in words, you see. To describe the Holy One is beyond our feeble speech. And so instead, we have stories like this one, stories of mystery without explanation, stories that crack open the door to the divine, letting as much light out as we can stand. That's what we get. And for now, it will have to do. For now, mystery will have to be enough. This is my son, the voice says from the cloud. Listen to him. Listen to him, because that strange, unexplainable night on the mountain won't be the end of the mystery. The path ahead is about to turn dark. Here we are, once again, about to step into the Lenten season our time to contemplate again the tender mercies of God. Ash Wednesday to Easter morning will be our own 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days to ponder and wander and wait. 40 days of a mostly downhill journey into the gathering darkness of Good Friday and the deafening silence of that Saturday after. Until, until an even more mysterious light, brighter than the mountaintop, shines on Easter morning. 
it's good that we are beginning this leg of our journey on the mountaintop with a story that embeds in us a memory of the light. As the darkness thickens, the memory will carry us through. This is my son, my chosen, the voice from the cloud said. Listen to him. Trust this light, even in the darkness. It will keep you company all the way from here to resurrection. Amen. Before we go to the communion table this morning, a reminder to those who are listening on the radio or watching us on our YouTube channel, if you would like to partake of the bread and the wine this morning, you can gather uh, bread and juice, whatever you have in your kitchen, and prepare that, and we will serve the community meal to the people here and to you at home as well. I want to take a minute this morning as part of our communion liturgy to address a concern that I have heard a few times since we began communi uh, celebrating a communion meal every Sunday here at First Church. This is not a complaint I've heard directly because almost no one complains to me directly. I guess you're just too nice for that. But I have heard this secondhand a few times. When we were preparing for Rachel Bauman's visit a couple of weeks ago, I told her that we share a communion meal every week, and I asked if you would like to be at the table with me when we did that on her day here. And her response was something like, oh good, I love a church that does communion every week. But as you may know, that her joy is not shared by everyone here at First Church. We have some people, and I don't know if it's one person or a lot of people, so you know, they don't complain to me directly, but let's just say it's a few people who find that communion every Sunday is not as special as it used to be when we only had communion once a month, the way it has always been done. Now, I take this concern very seriously. Communion is the beating heart of our faith. It's good for us to know what this meal is about. So I want to address this concern this morning from, from two directions. The first <clears throat> is to offer a simple solution. If you find that coming to the table once a month enhances your experience of God in worship, and I'm not doubting that it may, then please come to the table once a month. On the other three Sundays, stay in your seat. You'll be fine. There will be no questions or judgment directed at your decision. You can do that. You see, communion is not, and is not ever, a requirement. There is no rule that says you must be at the table every time the bread and wine is served. Communion is not a requirement. It is only and always an invitation and a gift. Now, the second thing I would say is perhaps a bit mystical, certainly theological. I've been thinking about this for a long time, for several years, but I've never tried to put it into words, so you get my first draft this morning. Jesus once told his disciples that whenever two or three of them were gathered together, he would be with them, in their midst, is how he said. And then, when he gathered them around the table, that last night he was with them, he took a loaf of bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take and eat. This is my body. It is for you. And then he offered them the cup, saying, this cup is my blood of the covenant. This cup makes possible a new and a lasting relationship between you and me. Here's the thing. <clears throat> When Jesus offered the bread and the wine and said, do this in remembrance of me, I don't think he meant remember in the sense of just recalling to mind that we would think about Jesus at this meal. He meant we would be remembered, reconnected with him. He meant that all those times in the past week when we chose to move away from him, to disconnect ourselves from him, would be forgiven and repaired. The breaks in our relationship would be repaired. The wounds healed, the cracks filled in, 
and the mercy and grace that we had turned away from would be offered to us again, graciously and mercifully. The communion meal, you see, ushers us into the community of Jesus' people, but even more importantly, into the company of Jesus himself. Now look, I don't know how this works. It is pure mystery to me. Some days I don't even believe it, but every week I try to trust it. Because if anything is true about our faith, this is. When we gather to eat and drink together around this table, Jesus gathers with us, joins in to eat and drink with us. And the way that only God can make the spiritual presence of Christ more real than the physical pews you are sitting on this morning, Jesus is here, sharing the bread and the wine, offering us the remembering, the repair, and reconnection that we so desperately hunger for. I don't know how many Sundays I have left on this earth, or how many Sundays the earth has left, for that matter, but my hope is on, on every single one of them. I will be, if only for a few moments, able to stand with my family and my friends in the presence of Jesus at this table, stand in the presence of the one who knows our name, remembers our face, and loves us more than we could ever imagine. This is why we come to the table. This is why we say, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So acknowledging the mystery of our faith, that Christ has died, but Christ is risen and Christ will come, has come again to be with us at this table. Come, everything is now ready.